So we are kicking the devil in the teeth lately. And this is part 10 of Angels and Demons. I didn't think we'd be going this, this far into it. I think we'll kind of, we'll, we'll kind of ease our way off next week. I am going to talk to you about prayer. Um, this morning, I'll, <clears throat> I want to talk to you about strategic prayer, <clears throat> especially as it has to do with the way that demons organize themselves. And biblically, we're told how they organize themselves, and I believe that we need to pray um, strategically, and I'll get to why that is in a moment. I'm just going to grab some water here. <clears throat> First of all, every week, I want you to know that this isn't just to be sensationalist, and, and, but I believe that Christians are being beat up because they're not aware of what the Bible tells us to fix our eyes on. Remember, to fix our eyes on. That means no matter where I go, I'm fixing my eyes on a spot. To fix our eyes on what is unseen. Not on what is seen, because whatever is unseen is eternal. Whatever is seen is temporary. That's 2 Corinthians 4, right at the end. And then we're told later in Ephesians 6 that our battle, our struggle, is not against flesh and blood. It's against the, the, the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. They are organized. We need to be organized as well. So we have this biblical commission to be aware and to battle in the unseen realm. Angels are commissioned to, to connect us, humans to God, and demons who are fallen angels are commissioned to disconnect people from God. Excuse me. And we are told, as I pray, I've never prayed that blessing before, I'll have you know, to be as wise as serpents and as innocent as doves. And what that means, Jesus said that when he sent the disciples out. He said, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. Be as wise as serpents, the devil. I want you to be as wise as the devil. But respond according to the Holy Spirit. And be as innocent as a dove. Second Corinthians 2, in order that Satan might not outwit us. And I feel that that's what's been happening in, in the North American church in particular. For we are not unaware of his schemes. And, and we've, we've looked that the main battlefield that he comes at you with is in your mind. So that's that 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. For we, the, the weapons we fight with are not like those, those of the world. The weapons we fight with have divine power to demolish not just tear down, demolish strongholds. So we take every thought captive and make it obedient to Jesus. Prayer, strategic prayer. I'm excited about this one because this, all of a sudden I realized this is something that I haven't been doing. And I, and I think I've let my city down a little bit. I think I've let this gathering down a little bit. I think I've let my home down. A little bit because <clears throat> why does God require this that we pray why doesn't he just protect you know you become a Christian and okay now you're in uh, you're now protected it's because he's designed it this way no other reasons he's designed it this way right from Adam and Eve he told them to subdue he told them I give you authority over this planet then when they sinned and they, they handed that authority over to Satan. We see that because, because when, when Jesus is, is uh, fasting 40 days and 40 nights, at the end of that, the devil has the audacity to come up to Jesus and say, see this, all this has been given to me, and I can give it to you if you just worship me. Like the audacity of the creator saying that to the creator. Anyway, so, but... Jesus knew the authority. And, and he didn't say, it's not yours, it's mine. He knew the authority. He knew this is the way it was designed. But then when he died on the cross and rose from the dead, he won that authority back and he gave it right back to you. When you become a Christian, 
So with Jesus, you have authority. Without Jesus, you're in trouble. You're at the mercy of that unseen realm. The power of prayer is by God's design. Jesus' Jesus's prayer in John 17. Listen to how powerful a human's, because Jesus was all man, all human, and all God. Listen to how powerful this is. This, this came out of our John uh, study. He, Jesus is praying to, to the Father, and he says, I am coming to you now. This is the night before he, he went to the cross. I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world, so that they, the disciples, may have the full measure of my joy within them. In other words, Father, I'm coming to you, and we can talk all we want up in heaven, but while I'm in the world, I'm positioned. I'm positioned to pray and have authority over the things in the world. Isn't that amazing? Hey, we're going to talk, but while I'm here, I'm going to use this position. Your position as a walking, talking human being is powerful, more powerful than it'll be as far as earthly things go than when you're dead and in paradise. Your position is powerful. And the accuser, so God is the judge, and he's positioned himself as the judge. Biblically, I can show you tons of scripture. God is the judge. And the way it's designed is he's going to have two lawyers, two attorneys coming towards him, approaching the bench, stating their case. And Revelation 12 tells us that Satan is before his throne day and night, accusing the accuser of our brothers and sisters accuses them before our God day and night. So he has that attorney, and you can believe he's stating the law. He's saying, I'm accusing that person. He broke the law. And, and so, I, you know, I have, a, I have, I got the goods on this guy. And so what, judges know the law, but they can't just say, Listen, this is the law, get it done. It has to be presented in court. And so God, by design, and even our human courts are the same, needs the defense attorney to come up and say, yes, but the blood of Jesus covers that. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Train up a child the way that they will go, and they will not depart from it. And the, and the judge can now say, I hear the accuser. Hear the defendant, the law has been stated. I side with the defendant. That's what prayer is. And we're not approaching the throne like that. <clears throat> it really is, it really is a balance. Um, I know I have it in here somewhere, but I, oh it's, it's for next week. I had to split this into, into two parts. But I there's there's the one part where Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6. When you, when you pray, don't stand there and babble on with many words, for God knows what you're going to say before you say it. So my prayer life used to be, God, you know my son? Do it. <laughs> you know what I was going to say anyway. You know what the needs are anyway. Why would I say it? But then I go to, to, to the book of James, and it says, you know why you don't have stuff? Because you're not asking so yes, God knows what you're going to say before you say it. But by God's design, He want, not just wants, He needs you to come before the courts and say, here's my case, here's my son, here's my daughter, here's my marriage, here's my home, here's my finances, here's my health. Whatever it is, God, by design, God needs you as the judge to come in to the courts Praise, oh, I could get into that one. <clears throat> and, and through the gates of thanksgiving, and present your case to shut the accuser down. Got that? And by the way, you can't present your case if you don't know the law. <laughs> Some of you, the scriptures I just read is more than you read all week. <laughs> and you need to. Man cannot live off of bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And some of your spirits are starving. Got to inject. 
yourself in, into the Word. God inject the Word into you. Don't inject yourself into the Word, actually. That's a bad idea. It's the other way around. I want to talk to you about regions, like geographical regions, like cities and towns and countries. We, we already read in Ephesians that, that our struggle is against the rulers. Well, rulers rule over regions. Authority, same thing. Dark, the powers of this dark world against spiritual forces in evil and heavenly realms. Not realm, realms. And so there's different regions <clears throat> that, that groups of demons and hierarchy of demons will set themselves up in. I'm going to show you that from Scripture. Daniel chapter 12. This angel comes to Daniel and says, Then he continued, Do not be afraid, Daniel. This big angel. Daniel's, Daniel's hit the dirt. And he goes, No, nope, stand up. It's okay. Peace be with you. Don't worship me. Don't be afraid of me. I need to talk to you. I've been sent by God. He says, Since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. Interesting. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, archangel, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. He's not talking about the earthly king. This is an angel. An earthly king is not going to detain the angel because we were created lower than the angels, Hebrews tells us. So this is talking about the spiritual ruler over Persia. Interesting. Then when we get to the New Testament, Luke chapter 8, we see Jesus and the disciples catching a little idea about this region. Verse 26 they, of Luke chapter 8, they sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torture me. <laughs> I love that. Because that's how demons respond when I walk into a room. Because I know the authority that I have in the name of Jesus. That's how they respond. When you walk in the room, I got some stories for you. But we need to we need to catch this from scripture first. Don't torture me. <laughs> For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. Jesus asked him, What is your name? Legion, he replied. Because many demons had gone into him and they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss well, a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside the demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs they begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs and he gave them permission when the demons came out of the man and went into the pigs and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Then all the people of the region of the garrisons asked Jesus to leave them, because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. What's happening here? First of all, when you see a herd of pigs, you know you ain't in Jerusalem anymore. These are Gentiles. These are not Jews. Jews are not herding pigs. They're not eating pigs. They're not sacrificing pigs. They're staying quite away from the unclean animal. Old Testament. <laughs> They're clean now because we 
we, that's what that's what God showed Peter when he brought that blanket down of unclean animals and that vision and said, eat what you want. He goes, I can't, that's unclean. And, and God says, don't call anything that I've made clean, unclean. So, New Testament, new rules. So, this is a Gentile nation. Why did the demons ask to be, to, to be brought in, to send us into that herd? They don't want to be sent out of the region. They've been working on this region for a good long time. They have control over this region. I'm going to branch out just a little bit. The boat ride to this region is when the wind and the waves is, is going crazy. And Jesus gets up and says, peace be still. And we love, you know, that, you know, who is this that the wind and the waves obey Jesus? Demons did not want Jesus in that region. Peace be still. He gets to the region, and now they have to come out of this man, and the, towns, the townspeople were afraid of that man. You don't tie up a guy hand and foot and put a guard over him if you think he's friendly. They're afraid of him. He is a, he is a dangerous man. When they come out and see him, and they see him dressed and in his right mind, just sitting there, normal, and they were afraid. They were afraid. Why are they afraid? It shows that the demons have been working on this region for a good long time and had control over this region. Don't send us out of the region. We've got a lot invested here. And you can see it in the townspeople saying, please leave. So Jesus got them both left. There is, there is a group of demons over Chatham Kent. There is. And I believe that we need to start This is the day that a remnant is now aware of the scheme, aware of the organization, and we start to take authority over that group that has been investing in our city. It's time to take it back. Amen. Addictions, mental illness, families, religiosity they've been working hard and we need to start praying with discernment God as I walk about my city give me discernment I want to break every stronghold <clears throat> shout Jesus speak Jesus in our streets when I was putting this together I was reminded <clears throat> When God called me to Chatham, and yes, he called me to Chatham in 2007. There's a whole story behind that with, with confirmations that would blow your mind. So I'm here. Actually, there's one time, it was the board meeting, and something happened in the board meeting, and I left, and I went, I don't think I can be here. And God tormented me that night. And I called Bill Pipke, the pastor at the time, back, the next morning and I said I'm your guy <laughs> God won't leave me alone and of course my concerns were all over finances and stability and all the rest of it because I was in a great church the, the church I went to is the smallest church I've ever been in till now <laughs> <laughs> when we, when I was driving in for my first, not interview, I had already said, yo, I'll take, take the job, I'll take the calling. Remember driving in from Hamilton, is where I was living in, it was a beautiful day, an absolute beautiful day. Sorry, God's, God's, I got, he's, he's telling me things that are not in my notes, this is amazing. 
As I'm driving on this beautiful day down the 401 corridor from, from Hamilton all the way into town, we get into Chatham Kent, and it's a big geography, isn't it? Get into geography. And, and then we're, as we're approaching Highway 40, as I'm approaching Highway 40, which is the first intake into our city, I see this dark, dark, dark cloud. It was a beautiful day hovering over Chatham proper. Still can, I can picture it to this day. And I'm turning onto 40 and I'm watching. And you know how on Highway 40 when you're driving up, the city's kind of to your left. And, and it's a good long drive off the highway to the left. If this dark cloud was sitting over the city. I remember as soon as I got to Grand, so over, over the tracks, over the river, and I'm at Grand, and I start turning left, going left, all of a sudden it started raining. And it poured, and the lightning, and the thunder, and it poured, and poured, and poured. It lasted probably two hours. I, I, the problem was I was running out of fuel, too. And I had to stop and get out, and so I'm panicking. I still remember that storm. And when the storm dissipated, I ended up getting fuel and getting to my destination. When the storm dissipated, over the years I've thought, yeah, I was driving into a storm. But I'm embarrassed to say that I haven't prayed about that storm. I haven't taken authority over that storm. And, and you, you folks in particular have followed my life since I got into this city. I drove into a storm. This remnant here that's gathered here and online, you know that God prophesied it to me about you? It was prophesied. That I was to, I have it on my laptop, I shared this a little while ago, but that I was to lead, I was to pay a big price. That was prophesied in 2000, Oh, I led my former church for five years. I was the associate pastor, then I was the lead pastor for five years. And but the years are just, I think it was 2015 that I became lead pastor. That year, I got the prophecy from a visitor who just traveled the world, and she read my mail, the church's mail, and predicted the future, and predicted this, that I would pay a huge price, that if I was willing to pay that price, that I would lead a refuge for the pending doom. That's the prophecy. And now here we are talking about how to take authority, how to, how to be aware of the schemes of the, the enemy. And I believe that you are the refuge, the remnant, and we're going to take down that dark cloud that I've ignored. Let's start right now. Lord God, we come into agreement for our city. We sang it already that we want to, that we have spoken Jesus over our city, over our streets. Lord, we pray against the authorities and rulers of this dark world that have chosen Chatham, we break it in the name of Jesus using the authority that you won for us on the cross. We pray that you break the stronghold over our city. Lord, we're going to keep on going, and not just in prayer, but we're going to walk the streets of our city and, and minister to the least of these and, and, and Lord, we break the spirit of religiosity over our city, over our churches. We break it in your name, Jesus. We, we break the stronghold over families in the name of Jesus over our city. We break the stronghold of, of addictions and mental illness over our city in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we're going to be looking for evidence of this breaking as we continue 
this is the first, this prayer I believe is the first fruits of, a, of hundreds of prayers that will go before your throne until we see our city set free in the name of Jesus. It's time to take back territory that we've just let the enemy take. I, about half a year ago, maybe it's, it's no, half a year ago, there's, was, there was a drug house two blocks from here. And it was one of my regular houses I would go to, and it was getting worse and worse and worse. And the main renter, the lady of the house, was getting worse and worse and worse. She was determined to get off of drugs, but she kept letting drug dealers come and stay in her home. And she was getting worse. Her, her, her children were with her sister, and her sister was watching her life watching her, her sister's drug habits getting worse and worse and was about to adopt them. So that this lady was getting worse and worse and would not, the area was, was, was getting just terrible. Next door to that house, there's a sweet lady, a born again believer. She struggles in her walk, but now every week we sit on her front stoop hug it out and sit and talk with the Lord for six or seven minutes. That's her church. One day she came out when this drug house was just at the lowest. It was dangerous, the people that were coming around and staying and tucking away in the basement. It was just terrible. She said, Chris, the neighbor said, Chris, I'm afraid to live here. And, and I said, you know, that's not right. So this is after everybody had come out, got their food, got their harm reduction, and scur scurried back into the house, shut the door, closed the curtains. It's the way some of them live. And I said, let's go pray. Let's go next door and let's pray. We walked over and there was a pillar at the front. And we both laid a hand on the pillar. We said, in the name of Jesus, set this house free. Clean up this house. I can now say, within two weeks, that house is cleaned up. And now that primary renter is drug free. There's no one else coming in and out of the house. And there's right relationship with, with her sister. And she's going to have her kids back very soon. How many, how many places have we passed by? And we didn't break the stronghold. If we don't do it, who is going to do it? feel like Christians are very distracted right now. They're distracted with, you know, building renovations and, and, and this and that. And it's time for us. I've often said, if Jesus came to the city and, and said, Chris, how can I be effective in chat? I'd say, okay, well, first of all, you need a building. We'll put a cross on. And then you, you, you probably say, what's the building for? Well, we're going to have weekly meetings. Oh, it's once a week? Oh, we can do two. We can do two. Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. Yeah, okay. Oh, and you're going to have an office. What's the office for? Well, it's so that you can prepare meetings and, and, uh, and your message for Sunday. And, and it's funny because I told, I told Crystal even yesterday, I spent more time in my office and I couldn't tell you what I did. It was just all, it was just, it was all so exhausting. But Jesus, you're going to have a board 
So you'll need to you'll need to look at minutes, and you'll need to look at, and you'll have a, you know annual meetings, and you'll have all these things, and that's all checks and balances. To make sure that you're you're doing things okay. <laughs> you're on the straight and narrow, Jesus. And, and, and don't worry, because the board's going to be made up, elected by members. You're going to have a membership. Well, what's the membership for? Well, it's people, you know, you, people will come. There'll be, some will be members and some will not be members because they're not ready to commit yet. And, and, uh, and, 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 and Jesus would go, you know what, if you need me, I'll be in the streets. We can't be distracted. We can't, we can't be distracted by just this. And I will say, this is such an amazing atmosphere. Sunday mornings used to be a torture for me. You know, and I actually had medical problems because of it. Getting tests and everything it turned out it was just stress. But this, this isn't a distraction for me. I can't wait for you folks to get here so that I can share what God has been knocking on my forehead about all week long. There, this will require for you to walk in step with God. Everything in the Bible is designed for it to work only when you're in step with God and paying attention to Him. <laughs> Everything. I was working out a couple weeks ago and I'm on my elliptical machine. And I was, it was a Wednesday, and I was actually reading the book of John, getting ready for the evenings, the evenings uh, Bible study. And so I was at a point where I could see Jesus, Jesus talked to Mary, was the line. And I'm reading it silently, and I see one of my street friends walk into the gym, it's very interesting. I know that he's demon possessed. When he's medicated, somehow the demon is unable to activate him. When he's medicated, he's my best friend. He loves me. Let's work out together. Let's, hey, you want to go get a coffee? When he's not medicated, he hates me. I mean, I mean, he wants he wants to punch my lights out. He hates me. It's wild. David knows this guy. He's seen the reactions. He comes walking in, not medicated. Hasn't been for a couple months now. And so I thought, that guy, who's gonna set him free if it's not me? And I'm scared because he could probably do some damage. Pretty big guy. The stocky. I've never been in a fight in my life. I know he's walking behind me. So I said aloud, Jesus, talk to Mary. Emphasis on Jesus. I see him stop. And he walked towards me, <coughs> right up beside the elliptical. And I still remember. He wanted to engage with me. He wanted, the real him wanted to engage with me. And when I said, Jesus, I, I believe, that, and this isn't to be sensational, I believe the demon lost some control because I still remember him for, looking at me and forcing a smile. Just like that. It's like he was fighting himself. I said, and I engaged in a little bit of conversation. I was very careful. I'm going to keep working on him. I'm going to see him set free. And if we don't, we just let them be controlled. Individuals, groups of people, our schools, our city. Our... It's time. It's time to take back territory. It's time for you to start taking authority over your home again. No, we don't do it enough. We, we, we do it, but we don't do it enough. It's time for us to take our children back again. And, and grandchildren back again. Parents, it's time to bring them back again. 
God, as, as we've been praying, He has shown us some of our children's spiritual distractions. So we've now started to pray specifically against them. It's time to take authority. It's time to approach the bench and say, here's what your law, here's what the law says. And I come with all authority and boldness through the blood of Jesus. We are positioned for this. And I can see people nodding. You're ready to go. We're building an army. And it's time to break the cloud, the thunderstorm. Oof. Over child cats. Now, now that we've talked about taking authority and approaching the bench and all the rest of it, and how to strategically pray about regions and take back, take back territory, I want to remind you that when you're praying, you're praying to your Father. Don't keep it business. There's, you've got to take care of business. But don't make your relationship with God. Keep it intimate. Keep it relational. He is your heavenly Father for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. He loves you. Don't don't go in there. I remember I remember one time, this is probably 20 years ago, going into a prayer meeting, and these two ladies were praying, they were taking authority over this and that. I couldn't even tell you what the topic was. But I remember saying, God, I'm so sorry. It's like they're treating you like a donkey. <laughs> Come on, go, 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 God, go, go. And I mean, there I mean, you'll get riled up. When you start taking authority over things, you'll start you'll start getting riled up. But I want you to always remember that you're speaking to your Heavenly Father. I do believe that when Jesus, when, when the disciples said, teach us to pray. Well, the word pray means to ask. And so what the, de what the, what the demons, what the disciples are saying is teach us how to ask God for things. And so what does Jesus do? He starts out with praise. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed, holy is your name. Thy kingdom come. Your will be done on earth is just worship. And then we're going to ask you a few things. Give us today our daily bread. Uh, help us to forgive. You know, for, forgive us. And we're going we're gonna to try to forgive others. And then he goes right back into, into praise to end it. Remember, when you're taking care of business, that he's still your loving father. Lord Jesus, we love you. God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we need you to fill us and to distribute your gifts accordingly so that we can battle, not against flesh and blood, but against the powers and authorities of this dark realm, of the unseen. Train our eyes to see the unseen. We pray for signs and wonders so that people can have fresh testimony that there is a God and He's active today. And he loves us very much. Lord, I'm excited. May this excitement not wane or fade over time. But Lord, we want to be as the phrase 30 years ago was, I want to be a prayer warrior. And walk in step with my God. I pray this in the name of Jesus.